Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christiana. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Christiana, Marcus, and the other organizers for inviting me to what looks like a really great uh, workshop. And I look forward to interacting with people throughout the week. So my talk is actually not about quantum error correction, nor is it about feedback. It's, um, it's about two topics. Uh, I can move this. Over. Uh, let me see. This works. It's about two topics that um, that eventually we would actually like to use feedback for, but they're um, both rather new in terms of um, the actual control uh, of the systems, and they're rather complex. So we're really st uh, still in the first stage where we are using open loop control, and so those two. Yeah, it's just uh, not working. Ah, there it is. Ah, now it's working. Okay. Right. Okay, so it's basically these two things here. Um, the first one I'll try to cover relatively quickly. It's been published now for a couple of years. Uh, it's about um, optimal control of a non emission qubit. And the second one is more recent, which is about optimal Zeno dragging. And so there I'll have to define what we mean by Zeno dragging. And that project does relate to actual quantum computation. This is a form of um, error mitigation that we're basically implementing here uh, for, a, for a, new a new paradigm of measurement-based quantum computation. But I will focus on the uh, quantum control aspects of this. So let me first start with the uh, non emission qubit systems. Um, okay, so I should, first of all, I have to make a couple of comments. So this will be the outline of the talk. So the first part will be the black and the blue. And here uh, we're doing continuous quantum measurements and quantum trajectories. We're actually doing um, no jump trajectories and uh, to monitor a non-hemicial Hamiltonian. And we're doing optimal control between the quantum jumps. In the second half of the talk, I'll talk about measurement-driven control um, STZ is shortcut to Zeno, which is a term we sort of uh, adapted from the shortcuts to adiabaticity in the unitary um, control literature. And here we're using, uh, again, somewhat serendipitously, it turned out that we um, could use a Pontryagin type of formulation to optimize this measurement-driven control. So let me start, first of all, uh, just with a couple of, um, okay, so there's a couple of actually introductory slides just about the difference between the measurements in the two parts of the talk. So uh, as Pierre mentioned, you can have um, either sort of, um, discrete uh, state updates, uh, which is what you would do if you had, for instance, a two-level system here. Imagine a superconducting qubit and in a cavity, and it's basically interacting with light. If it's a superconducting qubit, that would be microwave radiation and the light um, is leaking out of the cavity and it's then detected. And you can either, you will either hear a uh, click, you detect the photon exiting in the cavity uh, with efficiency um, amplitude square root eta. So eta is the efficiency. Or there may be some loss, and that's typically modeled by having a beam splitter on the output line, which says that there's, then the, your photon is lost to the environment. So then one can construct, in this case, for the discrete um, discrete um, state updates, a Krauss operator, which depends upon uh, where basically you have a unitary which entangles the system and the environment, and then you trace over the um, state of the, uh, um, the photon, and uh, you make your state update according to the Krauss operations that, that uh, Pierre uh, discussed in, in greater detail. And, um, and then your state of the system becomes your, then your readout R. So in the second half of the talk, I'll talk about um, diffusive evolution, which is when we are continuously monitoring the qubit. This is just an example here of a single qubit with um, being monitored by a measurement of the sigma z. So that's the measurement operator L. And that's what we're monitoring. And if we start off with average Z around here, or actually in a pure state, 
corresponds to the expectation value of z being about 0.35 um, or so, then we can follow individual trajectories diffusively, and some of them will go down to z minus 1, and some of them will go to z plus 1. And on average, if we have many, many trajectories, we'll stay where we are if that's all we're doing to the system, just monitoring it. Okay, so now let me come to the control of a non-Hermitian qubit. So non-Hermitian systems are quite popular these days. Uh, there's a lot of interest in them for both for fundamental reasons, because it's an extension of... Well, so non-Hermitian systems that generally have been encountered for many years in terms of dynamical systems with classical experiments. Uh, with classical optics circuits and so on. But there's also now been extensions to the quantum regime. And there, there's very interesting questions of adiabatic transport and possibly topological, um, topological control possible. But it's much more complicated than regular topological systems in Hermitian quantum mechanics because of this non-Hermitian um, character which basically means that you're, you're dealing with an intrinsically open quantum system. So even if you call it quantum, it's, and if you write down a Hamiltonian for it, it's an intrinsically open quantum system. So, so there's experiments that we're actually connected with in a group of case emerge using super nothing qubits, and that will be the model paradigm that I will to think about um, when I'm this part of the talk. And what we do there is we're looking at the um, quantum jump trajectories what we call these jump trajectories when we have our two-level system, as in the cartoon I showed you in the beginning, and that two-level system uh, interacts with um, some photons in a cavity, microwave cavity in this case, and if we see a photon emitted, that's a jump outcome, and if we don't see a photon emitted, that's a no-jump outcome. And as I'll show you in a moment, it's uh, very interesting. We can follow essentially the non-Hermitian system dynamics if we study just the no-jump outcome. So if we post-select on no jumps, and then we apply, we apply and develop and apply optimal control protocols on those no jump dynamics. So here's again, so here just a bit more explicitly. So we had click and no click options. So if there's no click, means we don't detect a photon coming out, then we can expand our Krauss operator to first order in T and we get um, our measurement operators in terms of the operator L, and the operator L is the system operator, which is the decay of the qubit, or the qubit, the qubit lowering operator from E to G. And then we have our master equation, the first order in T uh, here. And if we add the measurement in uh, the finite measurement efficiency, finite less than one measurement efficiency, the probability not being one, so previously what I showed was one. So if there's also some loss here, then this gets modified somewhat. And you can also see, probably from this, um, quite nicely, that if I set eta to be measurement efficiency zero, then this reduces to a Lindblad equation, which means that you're not detecting any individual photons output. And we so if we write this first term here, so we've, we've now added to this decay um, the process of uh, interacting with the cavity field and uh, uh, and undergoing the the, the, the lowering transition and emitting a photon, if we add this cavity a drive, a coherent drive on the system, on our qubits, then we have this green term here. And then we can put that green term together with this term here uh, of the, uh, of the um, dissipation to make an effective Hermitian Ham uh, non Hermitian Hamiltonian, so it's the purple part here with this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and that's the way that one learns in elementary quantum mechanics about how to include spontaneous emission or lifetime broadening of an of a atomic or molecular state. So here we're writing, we're taking that for our qubit in this cavity to be our non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and everything else is basically the, um, describing the, the continuous monitoring. So now I have to say a little bit about non-Hermitian systems. So if I take that purple Hamiltonian, which was basically a, a Hermitian contribution here from a drive on the qubit and this non-Hermitian term coming from the decay. Um, so if I write it like this in terms of um, the components along the three axis and blocks there, then one can diagonalize this and one gets then, and diagonalize it as a usual procedure, one gets the right eigenvalues. And we see that there's a point of degeneracy possible for certain values um, 
particular when the omega the drives in the x and the y direction uh, sum the sum of the squares is the gamma squared over four, where gamma is this rate of the decay. So gamma is the rate of decay out of the cavity. And um, okay, and so then when omega z is zero and you have this condition, you have a um, degeneracy of the eigenvalues. And so this type of system with this, so the I gamma is the non Hermitian component here in this two level system. And in this particular system, you not only have a degeneracy of the um, eigenvalues and the degeneracy of the, so you have a, you actually don't have a degeneracy of the eigenstates. You have something much more severe. You have a collapse of the eigenstates. In other words, you only have a single eigenstate. So you actually collapse your Hilbert space. You have basically reduced your Hilbert space just to a single um, vector rather than two. And that's what's called an exceptional point. And what's shown here in these plots are the real and imaginary parts of these right eigenvalues. And you see that in both cases we have, we're away from these special points. This special points here are denoted by EP here. And these are branch points and in the complex plane. And we see that you have a sort of switch in this, in this one of which one goes up and which one goes down. And the imaginary term here is very important because the imaginary component basically controls the decay of the eigenstate. And so here you're having a switch from one stable eigenstate here, the yellow one, and then if we go around the exceptional point here, now the yellow one becomes the unstable eigenstate. This has a higher image, a larger imaginary component. So these exceptional points are of interest to a lot of people because there's a lot of uh, theoretical and some theory experimental work, but certainly a lot of theoretical work indicating that you put a quantum system uh, near, or even a classical system, a dynamical system near an exceptional point, there's a greater sensitivity to perturbation. So how do we control these systems? So, so, so in the beginning, people looked at, um, you could say actually, uh, there's a lot of interest in the topology, um, and which would be most clearly seen by analogy with not, Hermitian quantum mechanics, if you go slowly around these ex um, exceptional points, um, it was soon realized, though, however, that you cannot adiabatically follow around um, an exceptional point because of this phenomenon I just indicated, namely that you uh, will, as if you go around an exceptional point here, you'll cross, you'll change from a, the, the lower, the more stable energy eigenvalue to the higher energy eigenvalue, and then you'll have decay. So people have looked at various things, counter-abatic, diabatic driving is one, perturbative dynamical corrections, there's quite a few, um, but not all of these things have been translated into the non-Hermitian context. Um, what we decided to do was to do contracts and optimal control. And this is, our, it turns out to be very nice in this case, we have a very direct, easy mapping onto Pontryagin control. So what we, so let me show you what we have here for a single qubit. So we have our dynamical uh, system here, which includes this drive of the qubit, this is now in the block vectors of the, of the single qubit, and the F contains the, all the measurement terms that I showed you earlier. And we want to impose dynamics, some dynamics, uh, so in other words, a specific set of little Qs equal to a capital Q. We want to impose those specific dynamics by the choice of the driving field omega of T. And so the idea here is if we have, if we have first of all, um, unit efficiency, and we want to start with, do we want to have pure states? We start with a pure state. We'd like to um, take our pure state trajectory, something like this blue and green one here, and we get to this point here. At that point here, the blue vector shows where we are at that time. The F of Q at that point is point, the purple vector pointing down, and the, the green vector pointing up is this uh, combined vector of the change of Q and the, essentially the drive, the non-Hermitian drive. And so we basically then define the vector, the red vector here by this uh, expression here. And that red vector gives us a direction about which we will to then rotate at a certain angle. And that will ensure uh, that we go on, carry on, on this blue line here. 
blue dotted line. So that's a schematic of what we're actually going to do. So the idea is that this, um, that this particular form of the drive compensates for this measurement term here, such that the, the Q dot will now generate the target dynamics that we want. So that will take us then in this that forward direction. So, so we know that we can realize any pure state from this kind of, first of all, preparatory kind of analysis. We know that we can realize any pure state trajectory for, for the per case of perfect efficiency. And so now we ask, what are the best paths linking an initial state rho i to a particular state rho f over some specific time interval? So we have this dynamic dynamical constraint. So now we need to find optimal controls, omega star, and also the corresponding optical dynamics that will um, extremize some objective function. And so that suggests going to something like Pontryagin, where one basically defines an effective Hamiltonian, a Pontryagin Hamiltonian, which is not a physical Hamiltonian, which contains, you see here, this contains a dynamical constraint in it right here as a Q dot term, and then has the additional controls that we want to impose. And so this first uh, constraint here, or parameter alpha, is what we call the agility. This parameter tells us that we want to get as close as possible to um, the final state, of course, so that's the distance from our target. And then we want to do this with minimum power. So we want to, um, we're going to penalize also as a parameter beta, called temperance, the magnitude of the drive, the unitary drive. And so now, as I was said, in the Pontryagin formulation, basically we have this as our action, and we have to basically um, variationally optimize, minimize the change in the action. And so that immediately leads us to this form here, you can check very easily, uh, to the dynamical equations for, for Q and the co-state uh, vectors lambda. And also we have a condition for optimization of H with respect to the drive frequency omega. So what we do in practice is we solve, first of all, the optimization respect to the drive frequency. And so single qubit, we can do this analytically. And then after that, we obtain numerical solutions for the specific trajectories. So, so here's uh, the way we do this. Um, so in other words, given some qi, so some in initial condition in q, and at some initial time t, we want to find out which solutions can reach our desired qf at a time tf. And so typically one would do this by some kind of shooting method, but what we do instead is we, um, we take, uh, we basically sample uh, for a given q sub i, we sample all possible uh, co-states, lambda i, and basically run trajectories to, to make what we call a Lagrangian manifold, show you a, pic, uh, a movie in a moment, and this is one particular um, trajectory, which would say, um, also, this is, sorry, this is one set of trajectories at some time t sub f. There would be low energy trajectories haven't got very far, have gone from here down to here. Higher energy trajectories here around green, here go from here, go further, and some of those will actually hit the, um, the, t, the q sub f value that, that we want at the time t sub f. And the energy, the uh, Pontryagin energy is conserved in the optimal dynamics. So that uh, also helps us. So now I have a little movie. So I'll show you some of these optimally controlled trajectories. So here, if we start here, oops. Okay, so what we did there, we started on the left-hand side of the block sphere here. This is a minus uh, the y. This is starting at the vector minus y here. And so started with a set of um, different energies of trajectories. And you see they're spreading out. The lower energy ones haven't spread out very much. The high energy ones, the red ones, are spreading out uh, faster. And then these, each of these points will, uh, um, will go on a trajectory around the block sphere. And then here, we can see that as we time proceeds, we are approaching from below, from the bottom part of the block sphere. We're approaching with the high energy uh, states first. We're approaching the target state, which is the plus y within a time t. And this is a typical state trajectory. So basically, the y is the dotted line. So we're going from minus 1 to plus 1, exactly what we want to do there. And these are the controls. 
So notice that this goes, it's, it's preferable to go around the lower part of the blossphere because the decay is from the state of the top of the blossphere. So the states of the lower side of the blossphere are protected. And then we can also look at the effect of efficiency on this. So effective efficiency, if we're going from G to E, then we have um, quite inefficient transfer. Yes. OK, so these are these trajectories. It's folding up inside into each other. And you see that we don't really manage to get to the top. We never really get back to, um, we don't get up to E at all. We have a larger error there. Um, if we have low efficiency. And that's because if you have low efficiency, it means that there is the decay isn't being detected. If we had, so if we have perfect efficiency, it means, doesn't mean that there's no decay. It means that every time there's a decay, we detect that photon and we take the information from that photon to uh, input into our control, parameter, uh, control protocol. If we have low efficiency, we just don't have the information and we're losing it. So the other, uh, the other, um, trajectory is less sensitive. So this is when we're going from minus y to plus y again. And here we can do this primarily by staying on the lower part of the blossphere. So we can retain higher um, if, uh, accuracy even for an inefficient trajectory measurement because we're not really getting close to the place where the efficiency of measurement is very important. So all these states down here, there is no decay from the state down here. So we're not sensitive to the detector efficiency of those locations. So the control agility, this is something I think some of you probably have experienced in other uh, areas before. This is a nice example of the uh, effect of these, using these parameters uh, of the constraints to actually mitigate decoherence. So these are plots. Um, so we're going to keep beta fixed. Beta is not so important here. Um, but if we want to, so we're going to now vary the alpha parameter and we're going to move from G to E, which is the hard one, over time T1 with low efficiency, zero um, efficiency. And this is uh, the, the, the trajectory for um, a value parameter alpha two. And the Y is the black dotted line and it's really bad. It doesn't really go anywhere at all. But if we increase alpha, Oh, sorry, we're going from, blah, 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 blah. sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, we are moving here from G to E, so don't follow the Y. It's the blue dot dashed line. Okay, so the blue dashed line that we need to follow. So we start off at minus one, which is G, and we want to go up to plus one. So we're, we're, we're not, we, we're below, above zero we're in the upper half of the block sphere, but we're not doing very well. So now we increase alpha by a factor of 25, and we get up a lot better, and we, then increase it even more, and we get free. Still not exactly one, but we go much better. And so this basically is consistent with the idea of you want to stay in the lower half of the block sphere for as long as possible, and then only at the very end you have a quick, um, a quick jump up to the top of the block sphere to avoid the decoherence coming from the fact that you cannot detect uh, decays from the, um, from the upper level very well. Okay, so, so that's the first part, and that's really um, so what I've shown you is, so this is the, the traditional view of, view of thinking about these non-Hermitian effective Hamiltonians, um, but they don't really invite very, good, uh, very effective control strategies. So what I've shown you here is if we think about it in terms of quantum jump trajectories, then we can use this very nice um, open control to uh, dynamically control our, our, our qubit system. So that's that. Now I'm going to move to measurement-driven control. And this is actually a much bigger topic, in a way. Um, so this, uh, so what we're doing here is we're looking at a system and environment, and we're having um, state updates. Again, they are in this form here with our Krauss operators. And now we're going to do things in continuous time rather than measuring individual photons. And so we will um, have a short time expansion for our, uh, measurement, for our measurement operators. And the important thing to notice here is I put in this measurement operator here now a parameter zeta, which is time dependent. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our measurement axis as a function of time. So 
Okay, so let's think about the quantum Zeno effect. If we have a single qubit and we start in the ground state, we want to go up to the excited state uh, with some, uh, we normally would do this with some nice unitary like a, a sigma y rotation if we're in the xc plane. But then if we start monitoring this, measuring sigma z, then this will basically, as we know, uh, the quantum Zeno effect, this will always push us back into the, in the ground state. And if we have strong measurement, that will basically pin us to that state. So, so the idea of Zeno dragging um, is that if we initialize our state so that it's in the it's an eigenstate of some particular measurement operator, and then we very slowly change that measurement operator so that the dynamics of the system changes, follows the eigenstate with high probability, then we would be able to take our system from, if we were to change our, constantly change our, op our, our operation, our measurement here, we could possibly drag the system up. So good dragging, however, means slow. Now, if the measurement rate, rate is gamma, uh, which is approximately the norm of the measurement operator squ squared, then the collapse occurs on the time scale of gamma minus one. And if you want to get high probability and high fidelity control via this kind of dragging, you have to move your measurement um, axis very slowly compared to the strengths of the measurement. Um, Okay, so if you imagine, I'm just going to lump all of those measurement terms. So if you forget about the unitary in here, I'm going to lump all of the measurement terms into this. So that's, that will come back again. So the idea here, the starting point, is that we will actually to do this in a, um, in a fast way rather than in a very infinitely slowly way, is that we will follow the measurement operator. We'll first of all move into the Zeno frame. So we have to define what the Zeno frame is. So the Zeno frame um, is basically a frame in which the measurement operator is diagonalized. So we have a diagon an operator D which diagonalizes the operator L. And then our row we transform our density matrix into a frame into row tilde, from row to row tilde. And then we write the uh, diagonalization operator R as e to the minus i upsilon t, the way to pronounce it. Um, so this diagonalizes L. And then our equation of motion for rho tilde, which is the rho in or rho under, underscore tilde, this is the Zeno frame density matrix. This now has the form of a, an effective Hamiltonian, which is the transformed uh, Zeno frame transformed drive minus this epsilon tilde up here, and then plus all of the other measurement terms. So what we then do is we make open loop control for a single, so the example I'll show you is just for a single LT, but we also have it with multiple measurement operators. So we need to have a differentiable L and also a epsilon tilde, but that's not an issue. And, and what we find is that the best fast dragging, and this was, not, this was a little bit unexpected, but the bit we, we can define the best fast dragging, which we call shortcut to Zeno, which is basically a counter diabatic drive, H, omega, which is chosen such that this H effective is equal to zero. So basically the choice of this H effective is defined, determined by the, the time dependence of L, the measurement operator, and then we choose our unitary. So rather than having effect in the Zeno effect, you think about I've got a fixed unitary and now I'm going to then push it back, push the state back all the time because I'm continuously monitoring it. Now we're saying, well, we have a changing, monitor, uh, changing uh, measurement frame and we're going to choose a unitary such that the effective unitary term in that time evolution now in that it, within that frame is zero. And then we'll still be have all the advantages of Zeno dragging, but we'll be doing it at a much faster time. Yeah. So, ah, okay, so where are we up to? Okay, 15 minutes. Okay, okay. Okay, so, so I'll show you, so that's the first part of this. And that part is conceptually quite straightforward. Um, I'll show you the results in a moment. But uh, what's interesting, what we realized in doing this was that there's a link, a very nice link to a, um, a stochastic form. And I think Pierre actually mentioned some of these, the works of Array and so on, right? So there's an, a, an approach to a continuous measurement, uh, which is due to Chantasri, Dressel, and Jordan, which is a stochastic path integral approach. Um, where you basically write uh, the, 
the um, well, we write basically everything as a functional integral of our what turns out to be a Pontryagin Hamiltonian. So let me just uh, quickly uh, go through this a little bit, which is that if we have a state update here, Q on our, our coordinate, so here is a measurement term, the F, and this is the first order, and that gives us readout statistics. So the probability of having RK, the measurement outcome, for a given uh, state QK is given in this form, and so G is a log probability uh, distribution function. And so we can write the probability of getting the full final state given um, the initial state zero and given all the readouts at intermediate times as this form here with a delta function. I mean, and expands the delta function to um, exponential uh, and by path integrals and then get, puts it in to get a path integral with infinite number of steps. And then one has here at the bottom this functional integral representation of the probability of going from initial state to a final state via a certain path involving all these different measurement records in between. And it depends upon this two terms here, which looks exactly like our Pontryagin term from before, and then this particular cost function, capital G, which depends upon the prob log probabilistic um, uh, probabilities of the individual readouts. So we define this to be our CDJ Hamiltonian, in honor of these people who originally developed this approach to measurement. So the action, so everything here, so the difference now is that all the, this entire action really comes from the, the statistics of the measurement of the, via this functional uh, probability, log probability function, capital G, in this functional. So now this looks very like Montreal um, and we will add, so that now we automatically have a constraint, G. This is our cost function, which is derived from the statistics. And so these, uh, so we're assuming that these are also Gaussian statistics. And so the, what we're defining here is, so again, R is our measurement outcomes. S is the average measurement. And then G is basically the variance of the average. And G is now a very nice um, constraint that can be used to optimize because G is positive, positive definite, and it's ideal for optimizing the Zeno dragging because it naturally uh, punishes you, you, you from being far away from an eigenstate of L. If you're in an eigenstate of L, this is zero. Nice. Anytime you go away from that, it's non-zero, so you know how to push it back. So we do the optimization here. So again, we basically just uh, run through the functional differentiation here. And now we have an additional equation. We have our, this is our same optimization over the parameters. So this zeta, remember, is the parameter that's going to describe how the measurement axis changes with time. And then we have also our differential over the R, the paths. These are the maximum likelihood paths. And so the putting it all together, one has pure state solutions following the extremal probabilities. So this is established by Chandraya, uh, Araya, and um, Jordan. And then we are looking now specifically at these optimal control things. So if we do this for a single qubit, five minutes. All right, so there's just a couple of slides here with um, uh, a single qubit example. So we have a single qubit example, and we want to, so in this case, this schematic here, I'm going from E down to X. And so my measurement axis is zeta. So that's going to be changing very slowly, and I want to see how the qubit state evolves as I pull that measurement axis along. So this plot shows that if we want to go from G, Z, from up here, Z to X, that the green parts here are the, where this cost function G is low. So we want to stay up here on the surface. If we start in a pure state, we will actually always stay in a pure state. Uh, as long as we are pinned to the, um, to the G zero point at all times, we actually have deterministic evolution. And it, so the, what, the things that can go wrong if, if we go too fast, uh, if we then have diabatic effects that leads to diffusion and escape, for instance, if you're at this point here, and then for some reason, or, or you have a random measurement, you can always, of course, there's a G over here, which is low. So if your measurement takes you over here, you'll have a small probability of escaping. And that's summarized here on the right, where, uh, so here, Philippe solved the Fokker-Planck equation to get this purple line here, which basically describes the prob probability distribution of being at a particular angle theta after you've started at z is zero. And so the measurement axis at this point is 
zeta here, which is the black line here, and that's where the peak of this row is, but there's a, a tail back here. And if you take the average of this entire distribution, you get this green point here. So your Lindblad dynamics will, um, will lag behind the measurement axis. And there's a little offset from the, uh, from the average. And then you can also, actually hard to see, but there is actually a little blip here. There is a little peak, uh, a little greater value here, at the exact antipode of this. And those are the escape errors where you're going to the opposite direction. So, okay, so let me see. Let's see. This, uh, so there was an experiment done by Shai Heiko and Gorgi. Uh, that time he was in Berkeley, now he's in Haifa. Um, and they didn't really understand, they did the experiment with um, doing a Zeno dragging. The term actually comes from them. And, or we, or we, we credited the term to them. I'm not sure whether they actually used it explicitly in the paper. Um, so they had a measurement axis here, the white, and they were dragging the measurement axis around. And this is plots in the Zeno frame. And they saw their distribution was lagging behind. They didn't, um, so what we see in, uh, with our optimization, that we have an additional term here that will explicitly compensate for that diabetic offset. So they didn't implement that, but if they were to have implemented it, they would be right on top of the white line. Um, I'll skip this, this. Okay, so now this is the, um, the, the solution. And so we, this, with this uh, CTJ, including and Pontryagin control method, we, the nice thing for the single qubit is completely analytic. So we have a linear, we find a linear schedule, which is optimal with this arc tangent term plus an additional term here. So this is the optimal schedule to drag a state from theta to theta, i to theta f over time t, where you're completely pinned at all times in the Zeno, in a, a Zeno, Zeno eigenstate. So that means that you have completely deterministic dynamics despite the measurement. And this is, to, when you, if you compare this with what we had with STZ, you find essentially that for STZ, you want this off diagonal terms to be zero. You find you get then exactly the same condition Zeta dot equals eta omega to have, to have the optimal condition, the same as this. So for this particular case, you get entirely equivalent solution. And this, this plot here shows, this is going from G to E for the single qubit. And this plot shows the, um, in the color bar here, the uh, fidelity. And these are for average Lindblad um, dynamics. And the dotted line here, so this is where people normally think about doing a Zeno effect, when your time is very long or when inverse gamma is very, very large, so the measurement rate is really, really, really weak, that you're very slowly dragging things, but you have to go out to infinity, essentially, to get unit fidelity. But what we see here is with our um, CTJ optimal or STZ ap uh, approach, we basically can come in at much, much shorter times but still stay on this black line. In other words, we can still have perfect fidelity with very fast Zeno you know, dragging. And so this is actually a globally optimal protocol because it's valid over all time scales. And I think I think I should have to finish right here. Uh, there's also results about robustness. It's actually very nicely robust. And this is the last slide, so I'll just leave it here with a summary. Um, this is actually the last part about the robustness. But then in general, uh, the, the, the method so with the Zeno dragging work, it works really autonomously. So it's actually very similar to uh, what Pierre was talking about towards the end. Um, if we can actually, we actually don't need to do the detection of the error. So that makes it essentially equivalent to autonomous uh, error correction. So the dissipation is enough. Uh, however, it is in some cases, if you, especially if you have inefficient measurements, then it's actually advantageous to actually go to the trajectory picture, measure individual trajectories, because then you can detect and actually correct the errors. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry, I have it. Okay. Thank you, Birgitta, uh, for this really beautiful work. I think you're blurring the boundaries between what means open loop and what means closed loop. But I think this is more question of semantics. Maybe there are uh, deeper questions from the audience. Thank you for your very nice talk. I was wondering, the first part, you started talking about exceptional points, and yeah. I was curious, uh, what's the connection to this uh, optimal path you, you choose using Pontryagin? 
So there's no direct correction, but the motivation is there that we know that if we go around an exceptional point, we're going to go from the lower surface where there is no decay. We're going to at one point switch to the upper surface. And that's not good if we want to go smoothly around the surface and to do something topological. That's what we don't have to do. But, so we have these sudden switches, and so that's not, so we want to avoid those sudden switches. So in that case, what you're doing is you're, you're using the control to, to, to have a better idea of where you can go to. And with the control, we could actually say, well, now we have to do this and this, and we can actually go around this, the point. We can, we can go around the point without having this decay. Well, generally you want to, yeah. I mean, there are reasons to go to the exceptional point. That's a whole other talk. Uh, but for this point, for this purpose, it's, I mean, so the, this this project was designed to just start thinking about how do we control non-emission systems. There was no control of non before. So this was just the first thing we could do is take a a qubit, a non-emission qubit. I mean, there are experiments with other theory with multiple qubits, but it's just one. And already, if you have one, a two a two-fold exceptional point, that's actually quite complicated. If you have more qubits, you'll have higher fold exceptional. Very nasty. But if you have already just have two exceptional points, then and you have one qubit, then it's non-trivial matter as to how do you go from A to B in a controlled manner in a time. So that was really the that was really the problem, and that's what we set out to solve. So we weren't particularly concerned about whether we go through the exceptional point, or we were thinking primarily would go around it. In fact, in particular, we were wanted to stay on the surface of the block sphere. Um, so that was one constraint. You can also have exceptional points in, a, in other places in the interior too. That's another matter as well. So, yeah. So, other some weird, really weird things happen when you go through exceptional points. So we wanted to avoid that, just to understand how to control. Further questions? Can we be first here and then I go up? Yeah. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. So you just mentioned the shadow cut to Zeno is uh, related with the counter debatic driving. Can you explain it more? So, so the idea is that if you are having pure Zeno dragging, you're always staying in an eigenstate of a measurement operator. And if you do it really, really slowly, and you're always staying in the eigenstate, then you're, go you're not going out. And so and you start off in a pure state, you'll always be in pure state dynamics. So we, we wanted to do that, but we wanted to do it faster because otherwise we'd have to do it infinitely slowly and we'd get bored. It's not, it's not helpful for doing something impractical, right? So to do it faster, the trick was to design, uh, to design a, a unitary that would, um, that would still allow us to be in such, always on the, Z, on the Zeno, in the eigenstate of the Zeno frame, as, but the Zeno frame is rotating, okay? And so that means that whatever unitary you put in, there's also some additional term from the, the, the frame rotation. So it was the design of that. The, the insight was that when we did it, first of all, the shortcut to Zeno, we did it that before we did the Contriagin approach. Uh, so the, in, the insight there is that you have some unitary, you've got freedom to choose that unitary. And so let's then transform to the Zeno frame and then see what else comes into the unitary as a result of that and then set that to equal to zero so that we then don't, so then we always stay on the Zeno, in the Zeno eigenstate in the rotating frame, but we're not, but the unitary is not taking us anywhere off it. Very quickly, um, how scalable, mostly for the first part of the talk, but also a little bit for the second part, how scalable is this to larger systems? I mean, you've shown single qubits, and you mentioned that you know the exceptional points become rapidly nasty. Yes. But how how scalable would this be to even like a, a qubit or a two qubit system? Oh, or something it's like certainly that? It's, it's it's certainly scalable to a qubit. Uh, yeah, it's certainly scalable to a qubit. 
So we started off with the non-hermitian systems. We actually started off with a pair of qubits because we were trying to see whether we can make logical qubits out of them uh, and look at, think about gates. But then we, the prolif they, they had very, very beautiful pictures of, of the eigenvalues and beautiful flowers and <laughs> surfaces and Riemann sheets. But um, that we decided to go back to the single qubit just to develop the control idea. But in principle, you could do it. You can certainly uh, scale up the, the control theory to larger systems. You will have to, it's not clear how much then you have to go straight into numerics, because a lot of what we could do for a single qubit was analytical. Uh, on the second uh, example, the, um, the measurement-driven control, we have done two, a single two qubits. It's not in the archive paper, but we, we have um, control of two qubit systems with basically also similar, certainly Bell state generation and, and some, not sure it's completely arbitrary, but, but you can certainly go up to two. But if you start to go much beyond that, then I think you have to go to large scale numeric to find the solution. And that's a bit of a... I think one could turn the perspective around and say, it's surprising that you can find a new control solution for a single qubit. So I think that's the, the beauty of, of this work.